And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, and managed to bane it before we even went live, good brother Xanatrix. <laughs> we are back. And much and much like much like before, much like before, now that we've handled the basics and covered and covered a bit of ancestries and backgrounds, it is high time for us to delve into the classes. And this will happen largely in a similar fashion to how how th how things worked out um, with level up, us going through classes individually. Unlike last time, we actually have twenty levels to work with. It's so refreshing. Having so many features we can look at and, well, have fun with. Mm -hmm. in, ad in, ad in, addition to in addition to that, we, ha we have um, we have several subclasses. In fact, we have a total of five subclasses for our entry this time with the Barbarian. And... We have, and because of, because of that, what well, um the the approach with the approach when I first started this, I had considered um gauging the compatibility of van of vanilla subclasses to this modified version. However, now that we've gotten our feet wet with it, it's very clear to me that the mod that um the subclasses in vanilla are going to be completely incompatible with this system. Yeah. I mean, that's not to say that you couldn't. I'm pretty. Sh I'm pretty sure if you house ruled it enough, you could convert it. But, uh, but um, at that po but at that point, you're you're less house ruling and you're more just home. You're more just home brewing wholesale. Yeah, you. It's you'd be kit bashing to such an extent that it. You might as well just call it homebrew. Mm-hmm. Now, with the, with that in with that in mind, as I said before, we're starting with the barbarian, which which is going to bring up a is going to be interesting because putting aside putting aside the fact that within this system, um, you're getting an equal amount of stuff from your ancestry as well as your choice of class, and in, in, because your ancestry actually matters here. This yep. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say uh, that this um, this this barbarian, just looking at the initial respects, is much different from from core. Mm -hmm. Is a lot of a, a lot of the a lot of the class design in. Vanilla Fifth Edition is very dependent on you needing your subclass in order to make things actually interesting. Some, um, there are some, there are some, there are some exceptions, casters, but but largely that's the way that's the way it's gone. Like the interest, like um, I jokingly said that characters don't get interesting until third level. <laughs> yep. And when it comes to, and just just as a, just as a reminder, when it comes to what you're what you're going to get from ancestries, just give me a moment because I'm loading up the ancestries and backgrounds document. And as a bit of an aside, um, we have to give our props to it's to Tanner, the creator of this project, because of because of the fact that <clears throat> he ha he has clearly been watching our um, bits of tomfoolery. And <laughs> and has and has been has been commenting, and in fact, some of the things that we've talked that we talked about last week are being implemented in the change log. Yeah, it's so and refreshing when people listen. I I uh, I'm gonna gush just a little bit here. 
the fact that he took time to watch the entire episode, make notes at specific timestamps, and provide those to us as feedback for our feedback. And the fact that I caught that uh, you're doing damage and a half with, with, with two of and fighting, even if you miss, and he hadn't caught that yet. I I am a I am wholly and completely happy that we have a creator so dedicated to their craft. That shows to me that not only is the interest in just creating what they're creating, their interest is in making this creation the best it can be for all the players and all the GMs out there. Mm-hmm. So, props to you, Tanner. Props indeed. Mm -hmm. I've already said it a couple times, but eternally. The fact that you take the time uh, warms my heart. And that's hard to do considering it's made of the densest metal from a neutron star, but uh, I digress. (laughs) Now, just as as a reminder, because... um, when you when you actually sit when you actually sit down with it, um, what you what a class gets is not going to be at, is not going to be as is not going to be as defining, since a lot of the things that would be standard within classes have been moved over into ancestries. The main thing that you're going to get from classes, aside from class features, is is your bit is your base vitality. Um, some some skill some skill prof- some skill proficiencies. Some def- some defense proficiencies, and of and course, you're raising the death flag modifier. Yeah. that that is so cool. I st- <laughs> that mechanic still has me tickled gray. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Instead of a less instead of black, I'm a, I'm a gray. Yeah, metalish color. And let's also, but things like proficiency bonus, um, is is moved over to. Your choice of ancestry, and some of the, instead of it being a instead of it being a universal thing across the board, um, of course, of course, there, of course, there's also the fact that it um, that it has a certain that you're going to have a certain level cap when it comes to your um, when it comes to your hit when it comes to your hit points. Uh, and. W- and because because of that because of that some of the things that would normally be covered within um within class aren't going aren't going to be present in fact i'd say the main thing that's going to be present is your choice of class features yeah cuz you know the 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 class itself at the at the very top is some of the things you already see in class uh what your proficiencies can be uh, what your vitality is, mm-hmm. uh, what the core ability requirements are, um, and then of course the one thing that's that's brand new—the raising the death flag modifier. But even your starting gear is defined here. Uh, beneath that is mucho, 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 mucho. Like that's all in the first half of the first page. Everything below that is class features, and that's a twelve-page doc. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, we have a lot to to bite into here, as it were. Yep. Uh. Now, the van- the vanilla barbarian is largely rage and survivability um, effects. Yeah, you're a you're a, a half decent melee fighter that can tank a lot of things so long as you're raging, mm-hmm. and that's even enhanced more so by the subclasses you pick. But even ignoring the subclasses, uh, just the base barb alone in vanilla 5e is... That's that's it. You, you put them at the front line, they absorb hits, they do some decent damage, and allow some of the squishier frontline fighters to uh, avoid damage while getting their bigger hits in. Mm-hmm. It's kind of boring. Yeah, it's like with like with a lot of the martial character, a lot of the martial builds in vanilla. 
it's a fallback to the it's a fallback to the Babby's first class approach when it comes to martial characters. Because you know you got to play a a martial character before you can play a spellcaster, don't you know? <clears throat> Otherwise, you're gonna fall on your face. I remember when veterans used to tell me that back during second edition AD and D. Yeah, I then told them to shut up. <laughs> um, it was absolutely hilarious seeing the seeing the conver seeing the conversion from 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 the skill tr when um when there was that Diablo two module for uh, AD and D, seeing the <laughs> seeing the conversion notes where you have where you essentially have to gimp the <laughs> very complex and intricate and and and, inter and um intricate skill trees in Diablo 2 into into the basic attack shit in um AD&D yeah for the for the martial classes <clears throat> but we digress mm -hmm. so the so the so the first th the the first, the first go ahead. The first thing on the page about this barbarian is flavor text, and I I am compelled to read it. Yep, go right go right <clears throat> ahead. So this is a quote from Grumman Barrow, half dwarven barbarian of madness. They call me mad, apostate, despot. But if knowing the truth of the world constitutes madness, I would not wish for sanity. Let my physical form match that of my mind, malleable, changing, adapting to the very chaos of the world and that which is beyond it. These eldritch truths, they fuel me, torment me, empower me. I change their shape, their nature, and thus the very surroundings of the mortal plane. If these are not the truths of the world, how is it they exist not only in my mind, but on my person? They call me mad, but all fear that which they do not understand. How could they? I show them mere scraps of the truth and it drives them away, shrivels them into nothingness. They're fragile, weak, untempered by the mutability of reality. They call me mad, but madness doesn't control me. I control madness. Did you have to go with the accent? I had to go with the shifting accent, yes. That was deliberate. If he's mad, his accent isn't going to stick. Does that mean that there is a... God help me. Method to his madness. And a madness to his method. Oh, sweet, merciful Buddha, help me. <laughs> the Buddha would tell you you're on your own with this one. Yeah. He's too busy hanging out with Jesus in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> For all of those who don't understand that reference, read Saint Young Men. And anyways, so the core ability requirements are are what you'd ex are what you'd expect. Um, not I, f I feel like I feel like calling it require I feel like calling it requirements is 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 something that should be adjusted because of the connotation that requirement has. Like we're not we're not dealing with the whole you've got to qualify for a certain class a la A D and D. I, I think a better a better term would be uh, core ability recommendations. Yeah, because the best barbarian will be either using strength or dex and resolve as their core abilities. Mm -hmm. This also means that we this be, because of because of that we're um I'd say I'd say we're comfortably not in a case of a <clears throat> case of mad because. We're giving the implication that barbarians are going to be either strength builds or dex builds with some resolve. Uh, it says here that resolve is the ability score used for skill or spell attacks you make as a barbarian. So resolve is their casting stat. Mm -hmm. So I love that. Um, next, when it comes to proficiency, we have light shields and standard shields. Let me see what the... Um, And simple for proficiency in all weapon types. Interesting that they instead of interesting that they don't have any sort of light armor. 
as far as um, their prof as far as their proficiencies. Uh, well, remember that the proficient you do also get proficiencies from your ancestry or background, mm -hmm. and uh, you probably get some armor proficiencies from over there. Uh, let me t let me take a let me take a look. Um, bonus for the for the dwarf. Um, not un not unless not. Unless you're go not unless you're going with certain feats, but then again, the then again, the barbarian is n is known as the half naked strong guy. So <clears throat> I suppose this fits. Yeah, but nothing will ever make me uh, laugh more than a dwarven gut buster. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's see. Proficient in either strength or dexterity de defense, depending on core abilities. If strength is a core ability, you're proficient in strength defense. If dexterity is a core ability, you're proficient in dex defense instead. If both are a core abilities from you for you, you are proficient in the defense corresponding to the higher of the two. If both are equal, you can choose between the other. And you're proficient in constitution and resolve. So that's four defenses that you're better at. Not not well, too shabby. Well three. Three because you do have to choose between strength or dex if you have an equal score mm -hmm. and so, they're both core. So we have the meme of strength build versus dex build. <laughs> <laughs> you can have yourself a barbarian. That is an evade tank. There you go. <laughs> you know, I'd I'd, l I'd laugh, but we're pretty much we're pretty much doing that with our own project. Touche. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. Let's see. Then for vitality, they get half their level plus their resolve, and resolve mod, resolve, resolve mod, and get addition. And every time they push forward, they get vitality equal to their resolve modifier. That's nice. Yep. Then we get to the death flag, raising the. De when a barbarian raises the death flag, they are instantly restored to full HP. Their movement increases by ten feet. They gain additional damage reduction equal to their resolve modifier plus their proficiency modifier, have advantage on all attacks, and they gain temporary vitality equal to half their level at the beginning of each of their turns while the threat remains. It was explained that raising the death flag was meant to be like this. The, the, the straits are now dire. Uh, the die is now cast. Someone has to do the heavy lifting to get the rest of the party the fuck out of there. Um, so, trading off your character, because that's what raising the death flag is, this is guaranteed, end of encounter, you're dead. Mm -hmm. For that sort of advantage, makes perfect fucking sense. And... Trust me, if you're playing a typical Nordic Viking or typical typical Nord Bearsarker, uh, they will remember you in Valhalla for that one. Yes. <laughs> so then we get to the class feat. Then, now, of course, when it comes to starting gear, three weapons of your choice, or two weapons and one shield, and one tier one potion or poison of your choice. Um, stand, stand about what you'd expect. Yep. Then we get to the features, and I feel like I need to compare the ra the rage from vanilla with the rage from um, heavens and heresies. So vanilla, um, you get advantage on strength checks and strength saves. You get you get a level you get a level based bonus based um, to da to damage with strength attacks. And you get resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing. It, 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 and it lasts for one minute. And it, and, and you can, and you have to finish a long rest before you can rage again. Mm. Then we get to Heavens and Heresies version. So <clears throat> you have advantage on. Variant. Well, I was yep. going to read the flavor text. Oh yeah, go ahead. 
As a barbarian, you can fill yourself with fervor and fury to aid yourself against any who would oppose you. Let's see, while you are threatened, you may enter into a rage. While raging, you gain the following benefits if you aren't wearing armor. Your advantage on strength checks. When you, you, when you make a melee weapon attack a th or a thrown weapon attack, you may add your proficiency bonus as damage in order to... To cause you to lose all your remaining willpower and knock you unconscious, damage from an attack must reduce you to zero hit points and exceed your maximum hit point total, rather than half. Your ra your rage does not end if you f fall unconscious and only subsides when the encounter is over or the threat is no longer present. At the beginning of your turn, you may choose to attack recklessly. If you do, do you have advantage on melee and thrown weapon atta weapon attack rolls, but you make, but melee and thrown weapon attacks have advantage against you until the beginning of your next turn. You know I'm always a sucker for risk-reward systems. So th this is actually something that we did directly discuss in our project as well, so mm -hmm. I like that. Um, <clears throat> so now we see why they don't get an armor proficiency. Because armor does them no good in their rage. Mm-hmm. So this is this is really playing into the half naked strongman archetype. Yes. As opposed and that's to as opposed to just poor man's Hulk. Yes. I uh I really like the fact that it's just like I'm going all in on killing you. Mm -hmm. Because there's there's no there's nothing here that reduces uh damage you take it just makes it so that in order for you to go to zero hp you have to have an attack reduced to zero hp and exceed your entire maximum hit point total which, that's uh which means which means you which means you ca which means you are the embodiment of i didn't hear no bell <laughs> okay randy <laughs> i didn't hear no bell mm -hmm. I guess Randy could be a barbarian in Heavens and Heresies. <laughs> um, um, I, I especially like that that the reckless attack, which in other systems is its own feature, is an included feature for this feature. It's an included secondary piece of the feature. What I do, what I do like here is the fact that. Um, Rage is rage is not on a arbitrary time limit. Yeah, you rage until the encounter is over or the threat is gone. As opposed to a mit and even more so, there isn't the whole there isn't the whole fatigue bullshit. Which yeah. en which ends up discouraging people from using rages more often than not, in my experience. Yeah, it just happens when you're threatened. When you're threatened you enter into rage. Um, but now we also see the other reason that they don't have armor, the second first level barbarian feature. Ar Unarmored ar defense. Mm -hmm. You gain DR equal to your con mod. You can wear a light shield or a standard shield and gain the and gain its effects. Unlike all other DR, this, d this does not, this um, reduces damage taken from conditions. When you're not wearing armor, your resolve grants you hit points equal to half equal to half your level um, round rounded up times your resolve modifier. So um, we are we are leading a little bit into into the into the into the, into the tanky setup of the um, Final Fantasy XIV um, warrior, you know, who's got who can get ridiculously high HP compared to everybody else, even other Ridicul tanks. Ridiculously high HP, and he's not bad as an off DPS. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that I think this is a better form of unarmored defense than oh, just just add just add another ability modifier. Yeah, this is this is a uh, you can still use you know most of your shields too, and you just get DR and you get bonus HP. While not wearing armor. Mm -hmm. 
So if I'm gonna be if I'm gonna be Conan here, I'm gonna be Conan here. Yeah. <clears throat> then we have Primal Vigor, where while raging, you may utilize a quick action five feet in order to expend an amount of vitality equal to half your current level rounded up. For each expended vitality, roll 1d10 and add your con modifier to the roll of each d10, and you gain hit points equal to the total. And then there's a developer's note here. In this system, HP isn't the same as health. Hit points are the point at which you are hit and can represent something different depending on the character. This can be a measure of a character's grit, ability to aid attacks, or magical defenses, whatever the player chooses to represent them as. So this feature is less Wolverine regeneration and more akin to an ability to avoid a truly damaging strike throughout a fight. That, <clears throat> that is an interesting thing to bring up. Because I remember when healing surges were first, int were first introduced into 4th edition. And a lot of people were a lot of people were saying that a lot of people were claiming that it was over magicking because because it was self healing a la Wolverine. Even though hit points are very much an abstraction. And this is one of those uncomfortable truths that a lot of people don't want to acknowledge. Hit point if you hit points are not a measure of health in that sense. If you really want that, um, there are wound systems for that. Wound systems, or in the case of Heavens and Heresies, Vitality. Which represents your, your, you know, Vitality and Willpower. That internal, more focused will to live, essentially. Let's not forget that going to zero hit points doesn't mean you're dead, it means you're knocked out. Um, a la most Final Fantasies, incapacitated or KO as it's usually called, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's only the convenience of life being a short four-letter word that could fit within a character limit that got us the life spells because they were originally called raise, arise, etc. Yeah. Um, it, it, the implication behind most systems that have health points or hit points, or any other way you want to call HP, is that this is the growing battle fatigue. This is, the, the, the less you have, the more likely you are to slip up on the battlefield and end up unable to, to battle any longer. And that's, that's what this, this abstraction actually really feels like that. Especially with the description that they get, that uh, that Tanner gave. Yeah, I just I just I just feel it's I just feel it's apropos to bring that up because this is one of those things that a lot of people, even even veterans, screw up. Um, yeah, zero HP is not death. I remember when it was neg ten HP. Pretty pretty much. Um, Let's see, then we get to second level where we have tough as where we have tough as nails, you boot which is which is gonna be your first gonna be one of your um a, one of your ASI improvements that isn't from your ancestry. And you're gonna cool. get another one of these at sixth, tenth, and fifteenth level. Yep. And then it's uh strength decks are con by two. Mm hmm And you cannot choose to raise your highest ability score in this way unless two or more of your highest ability scores are equal. I do so I do like that when it comes to ASI in this ki in this setup there are restrictions so that people don't dump it and try and get and try and race to 20. Yeah. Uh, let's see then we have char we have charge your movement increases by 5 feet while you aren't wearing armor and each round you have additional 10 feet of movement, which you can only use to move toward a threat. So you get 5 additional feet to move anywhere. Mm -hmm. But if you're charging somebody, uh, thus the feature name, you have another 10 feet. Yep. So that's that's 15 additional feet total if you're going towards something. Yep. Um, 
at third at third level you start on your you start on you start on the path of one of your archetypes um in this case barbarian paths although i'd i'd say given the stuff that's at first at second level that thing i mentioned before about classes not getting interesting until they get their subclasses i don't think applies as much here no a lot of the things in first and second level especially things like primal vigor the ability to to spend vitality to get hp um or even charge which you know gives you the ability to close in on a threat very quickly because you can tell with the secondary feature the secondary part of that feature a lot of it is you're the guy who rushes in and beats the shit out of stuff and you get the shit beaten out of you too but your whole thing is i'm raging you can't hurt me as much as i can hurt you um and that's just with just that stuff alone before even before you actually take your barbarian path that gives you more flavor um much like an original bat an original no not an original bag an original can of uh pringles even those are pretty good once you pop you can't stop Mm -hmm. I'm sure a barbarian would say the same thing about all the heads that he's taking. Once you pop, you can't stop. <laughs> but we'll get into the, the paths further down in the document. Um, the paths do give additional features at 7th, 10th, and 14th levels. So mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of flavor that fills in those those particular places All right. Now, with the, with that in with that in mind, then we get to fifth level, which gives which gives us cleave. Um, once per round, we you may have your weapon attack deal an additional die worth of damage. In addition, you may add your ability modifier to your damage um, rolls with weapon attacks an additional time. You gain the Great Weapon Fighting Style. If you had previously taken the Great Weapon Fighting Feat, you may gain another martial feat of your choice in its place. I'm starting to see... I think this is... Tanner had, Tanner had DM'd me um, a few days ago and said and said that maybe we should tackle feats before, before we tackle classes. I think things like this are probably why, but I, just, but I felt that I needed to go with classes before I went with feats because... Classes are going to be the most player-facing setup. Whereas yeah, they're going to have the most meat to bite into as well. Yeah, that's not that's not to say we won't get into feats when the time comes. I just felt that classes should have been a higher priority for us, but I can see why he gave that suggestion. I have um, a song playing in my head, Monk. Can you guess what it is? Guts and blood and <laughs> blood and guts. Uh, barring the fact that guts wears armor, this is guts through and through. Which is uh, apropos considering the name of his source material. Yep. Um. <laughs> this says you can apply the effects of this fighting style to weapons that do not have the heavy quality. In the case of thrown weapons, the weapon will be able to pierce targets behind the initial target rather than adjacent to if the attack kills the initial target. <laughs> like I said, it's guts. Mm -hmm. It's fucking guts. Let's see. At higher levels, then you ha at 11th level, it becomes cleave plus. Once per round, you may have your weapon attack deal an additional die worth of damage for a total of two additional die. And may add your proficiency modifier for for damage rolls with weapon attacks an additional time. And after killing a threat and before applying re the remaining damage from your weapon to another threat, you may move 10 feet as a free action. Finally, your range with all thrown weapons increases by 10 feet. So here's Greater Cleave. Mm -hmm. And at 17th level... Once per round, you may have your weapon attack deal an additional dice worth of damage for a total of three additional dice, and your range with all thrown weapons increases by ten feet. Probably should put the probably should put the total the totals in parentheses on both ends. Well, 
yeah, again, clarity is probably most of what we're going to nitpick here. And it really is just a nitpick. Um, because I, I still, I can follow this enough to go. So that means that that uh, with greatest cleave, as I'm going to call it, because mm. cleave plus and cleave plus plus, while funny to say, are uh, this is not a programming language. We are not programming and killing things. <clears throat> uh, essentially, at, at greatest cleave, you have three additional dice worth of damage uh, to your weapon attack. You also add your proficiency modifier uh, an additional time. Mm -hmm. And uh, after killing, you'll still have the 10-foot the ten movement. And the throwing weapon range increases by a total of 20 feet. That 10-foot free action movement is the 5-foot step that Great Cleave used to give you in, in, back in the day, except better. Yep. See, then we go into the Great Weapon Fighting fighting style. Whenever you reduce a creature to 0 hit points with a melee weapon attack from a weapon with a heavy quality, you may deal the excess damage to another creature within your melee reach, provided your attack roll would, al would have also hit that creature. Before you make a melee weapon attack with a with a weapon that has the heavy property and with which you are proficient, you can choose to not add your proficiency to your attack roll. If you do so, you may add 4 plus your proficiency modifier to the damage roll if that attack hits. So great weapon fighting is basic cleave and power attack in the same one. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. And on a, on a miss, you subtract your proficiency modifier from the total roll of the damage dice before dealing half damage, minimum one. So not only do you... So we have three things with great weapon fighting. We have cleave. We have... Uh, we have power attack. And we have still hit, though. Well, all misses are half damage to begin with, and but this one, with, if you choose to use power attack, uh, the still hit though is because you missed your power attack. You're just kind of tinking them. Chip damage. Hey, chip damage is still damage. Yeah, but chip damage can't win you the fight. You have to actually get a hit. Mm -hmm. In in some games, other games, chip damage does win you the fight, and I think that's bullshit. But that's the <laughs> different story. Yeah. Let's see. You also get a bonus martial feat, and you'll get and you'll gain additional one at eleventh and seventeenth levels. Um, then, at ninth level, you get brutality. Insert your Mortal Kombat joke here. Brutality. There you go. I will, I will, that ended up almost breaking my damn thumbs trying to do trying to do those. Um, I know they were they were they were Tekken ten hit combos before Tekken was a game. Mm-hmm. Well, Te well, Tekken. I first saw it in Mortal Kombat trilogy, and Tekken was already a thing by that point. But I don't remember. Ten I don't remember seeing um, the ten hit combo th thing become become part of the canon until I want to say um, I want to say Tekken three. five. Oh, yeah. Th almost yeah. almost every character had a ten hit combo in three. Yeah, you in just their didn't, move list. Yeah, you just didn't hear a whole lot of people talking about it because with three, everybody was pissy about. Fucking Eddie. <sighs> I love that cheap bastard. I also hate that cheap bastard. Mm -hmm. anyway, but rails. Anyway, your threat range increases by one, and attacks ignore an amount of DR equal to your resolve modifier. So now you have a, a 19 and 20 threat range, because threat range for everyone was 20 without feats. And potentially your backgrounds or ancestries could have given you another feat that increases your threat range even further now. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see. But ignoring that... DR, holy yeah. shit! Yeah, especially especially if especially if you've if you if you've dumped a high abil a high amount a um, high ability score into resolve. Well, if you're planning to play a barbarian, I don't see why you wouldn't. Well, just ima just imagine how devastating this is going to be if um, if someone's got if someone's got a resolve of twenty. <laughs> I ignore five dr. Uh, uh. 
let's see, then we have physicality, where if the total for a physical ability check is less than the corresponding ability score, you may use the corresponding score rather than the total. It's a nice um, it's a nice safety net kind of fe kind of feature. Basically, if the DC is lower than your ability score, you're basically no, going to get through it. Not not the DC. If you if the total that you rolled is le no, is what I'm what I'm saying is, if the total that you roll is less than your ability score, you can use the score for the total. Which means that any DC for a physical ability score lower than your ability score is an auto success at that point. Yeah. Let's see. So, then. It's a nice, it's a nice way to, it's a nice way to actually use ability scores, since that's done so, since that's not done all that often. Yeah. Um. See, so then we have reactive rage at thirteenth level, where primal vigor can be used as a free action on your turn rather than a quick action. <laughs> I don't have to use any of my action economy to restore my HP. Let's go! Yep. Let's see. At 15th level, you get dire criticals. So whenever you score a crit, you can you can step up the damage dice by one by one for that in, for that in, or at, for that instance of damage. A D12 upgrades to a D12 plus one in that case. Like so, I, this is basically a standard step up. It's just that it's just that um, you get a static modifier if you're stepping up higher than D12. Yeah, well, I mean, it'd be kind of insane to step you up from D12 to D20 damage. Not only is that heavily swingy in the damage department, but imagine you get a 19. Mm -hmm. Ugh. Let's see. Thank you. <laughs> that encourages some a little bit of crit fishing, though, if you really want to. Mm -hmm. I like the variety. Yeah. Let's see. At eight at eighteenth level, you get through gritted teeth. You no longer will lose willpower at the end of your turn as a result of having zero hit points. Taking damage while at zero hit points still counts against either your willpower or vitality as normal. So once again we have the I'm still standing kind of thing, and the capstone is never say die. Whenever a threat deals damage to you while you are raging, you may gain one vitality as long as it dealt five or more damage before DR was applied. So it's the t damage total prior to DR. So it's potential that if you have a high enough a high enough DR on your con mod, because remember, it's minimum two. You, if your con mod's high enough, you could have five DR. If something only deals five damage, your DR takes it to one and you still gain one vitality? <laughs> mhm. Mm That's There's there is a level 60 skill for the Dark Knight in Final Fantasy 14, or at least it was level 60. I don't know where they moved it to now. Um called Walking Dead where it was a, a, an ability uh it lasted 12 seconds and if you were reduced to 0 HP within those 12 seconds you then got an eight-second timer where you were allowed to stay standing, and if someone restored you to full HP prior to that eight-second timer, you were alive. It was a way to, to, to prevent death in the event that a tank buster was coming and nobody could raise some defenses around you or your cooldowns were mistimed. Mm -hmm. This reminds me kind of of that. Not the same exact, obviously, because the mechanics are quite different, but the intent. Mm-hmm. And it's it's certainly a, it's certainly a step up on a capstone than ju than just one gi than one giant ASI boost. Uh, we don't we don't we don't talk about that anymore, Monk. We're finding better alternatives, mm -hmm. <laughs> especially at heresies. Yeah. So then we get into the archetypes, and the first one is Path of Blood, which. Um, is very is very much seems to be emphasizing that whole pushing you across the line. The first feature is um, blood for blood, a simple trade, your blood for theirs. When a cr when a creature with a me with a melee or thrown weapon, when you hit a creature with a melee or thrown weapon attack while raging, you can expend vitality equal to half of your current level, max five, rounded down. 
When you do so, add 1d8 physical damage to the roll for each expended vitality. Both you and the creature take this additional damage. When you score a critical hit with this feature, you may double the amount of dice you roll for damage as normal, but only take damage for the initial spent vitality. At 10th level, you gain resistance to damage dealt to yourself through this feature. <laughs> I'm going to bleed and you're going to bleed, but as I get stronger, I bleed less. Mm-hmm. Um, this feels... Why am I getting... Why am I getting... Damn it! You put the you put Dark Knight's um, Soul Leader ability in my head when it comes to thinking of this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but yeah, that is it is basically fuck me, no fuck you. Um, at seventh level, they get Commune in Blood. You may expend one vitality in order to use the Speak with Dead ritual in the Divination Artistry. You may only use this feature to commune with spirits that have died within the last 12 hours. You need not have proficiency in the divination artistry to prov or provide any materials to use this feature. You gain information as, you, as if you had provided one material whose quality is based on your current level. At 1 to 4, common. At 5 to 10, uncommon. At 11 to 16, rare. At 17 to 19, very rare. At 20, legendary. At 20th level, I commune with dead as if I had uh, spent a legendary material. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, that's that's fantastic. It, 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 that makes it useful no matter what point in your character progression you're at. Yeah. At 7th um, level, you gain Bloodlust. Whenever you kill a threat, you gain temporary HP equal to your resolve, plus ca resolve mod plus character level. If you kill a creature and your temporary hit point total is equal to or greater than the amount you would receive from this feature, you may regain one vitality instead. In the course of a single turn, killing multiple minions of the same pack only counts as killing one creature. That's a good, th that's a good caveat to add, since minions only have one HP. Yeah. A, a little bit of, uh, of an explanation there, though we're not going to get into too many details. Uh, there are multiple creature types and encounters, and multiple ways encounters can be re uh, resolved. Mm -hmm. uh, the lowest creature type, a minion, or a mook, or whatever you want to call it, is a thing with one HP that you literally don't even have to roll to hit or kill. You just declare you moved to it and killed it. Um, it's kind of there as an obstacle more than anything. Mm-hmm. And remember, as we said, there are multiple ways to resolve encounters. Uh, one of the things Tanner clued me in on is there may be encounters where fighting to kill everything is a bad idea. Such as endless packs of goblins from the mines or whatever. Goblin Slayer, anybody? What? Mm -hmm. uh, why do I hear boss music? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's something we'll get into further down the line when we do the encounter -y proper. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to make that clarification. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> and when it, I think the I, and odd, oddly enough, because of how because of how bloodlust is set up, it's actually it's actually encouraging you to keep your temporary HP low. Or, or, if you need more vitality, to reap as much temporary HP as you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I and again, again, take again, taking taking something that's already there and turning it in, and turning it into a multi-purpose resource, which is kind of the thing we've been doing with our own project. Um, that making th making comparisons between our project and Heavens and Heresies, I think, is a uh, is giving our project a lot of credit and also showing how much we like Heavens and Heresies. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but we, but we are on we are on we do seem to be on similar wavelengths in terms of design philosophy. Um, yes. So at tenth level, you gain Rupture. When you're hit with a weapon attack, you may also inflict a severity of the afflicted physical condition equal to your resolve modifier. And whenever a creature moves while afflicted by this feature, it gains one severity of the of the afflicted physical condition for each five feet it moves. 
That's a good way. That's a good way to ki to kill off the en the endlessly shifting cobalt fuckery. <laughs> uh, I like the fact that it's called rupture. Do you know what it reminds me of? What? And yes, everybody's <clears throat> going to everybody's going to think this is pretty weeb of me. Um, the rupture spell used uh, in irregular at Magic High School. Where people blow up because their blood is exploded from inside them. <laughs> we here. There's. Do I look like a grog to you? No, but I can hear the grog screaming, and that's why I said it. Good. <laughs> and there. And the path capstone for Path of Blood is Living Blood. Creatures cursed by your rupture feature have a severity have a severity of the vulnerable condition equal to your resolve modifier for as long as they are afflicted by the feature. Um, <laughs> I, f I feel that I, that we need to, we need to look into, we need to, we, need to, we need to look into, um, yeah, into, con into conditions. So now I got now I got to fig. So now I got to figure out where that it where that was. Because I, I think that something in introduction and setting wasn't it base mechanics. I believe so. Let me let me grab that. Oh, I'm already over there. Yes, conditions and wounds. Uh, page looks like page my here. Thirty-eight to fifty-nine is where it starts. Mm -hmm. um, so afflicted condition uh, first to go over with afflicted because we're afflicted physical. Yep. Uh, the the afflicted condition is measured in severity and can take many different forms depending on the feature which it apply which applies it. A creature afflicted with fire or afflicted fire comma two in the case of two severity of the condition is said to be burning. Whereas a creature afflicted with cold or afflicted cold, comma three, in the case of three severity of the condition, could be said to be frostbitten, and a creature afflicted with poison, comma four, is poisoned. If a character is harmed by something that causes them to bleed, they are said to be afflicted physical. So bleeding makes sense, rupture, and it's the path of blood. Mm -hmm. Or if a character is hit with a viscous acid, afflicted acid. Only ten stacks of a single type of a condition can be applied to a creature at any given time. So a creature may have afflicted fire 10 and afflicted poison 10 at the same time, but not afflicted fire 11. Yep. And then, Afflic as for what it does, mm -hmm. at the end of the afflicted creature's turn, or every 10 seconds if initiative is not being counted, a creature takes damage of the type specified by the condition equal to the severity of the condition. After taking this damage, the severity of the condition reduces by 1. And then vulnerable... Uh, when a, when a creature is afflicted by the vulnerable condition takes damage, the threat range for attacks against it increases by one for each severity of the condition. So, so by using rupture... You are doing you some are crit fishing. <laughs> Path of blood is your crit fisher. It's a, do it's a dot crit fisher. It's a dot... What is this world?! <laughs> <laughs> a a damage a bleed damage crit fisher those are two things i never thought would go together and 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 the risk versus reward is hurting yourself to hurt everybody else mm -hmm. what is this i love this and it can and it's this is the only the only way you could possibly get away with this is is if you ha is because of the fact that the core um, barbarian in this setup has hit points for days. Mm hmm. So it can t it can take a it can take a few hits and still and still be fine. Whereas other classes might have a bit of trouble. I mean, with the high amount of HP that they can get that they can get, along with all the temp HP that's possible. Yeah. 
I, I'd just like to point out that with Rupture and Living Blood, bro, both, it's your Resolve mod that inflicts the severity. Mm -hmm. So if you're at 20 Resolve by the time you get any of these, or you get 220 Resolve at some point, that's five, five severity of afflicted physical and five severity of afflicted vulnerable. And remember that they gain a severity of afflicted physical for each five feet they move? So if they move 25 feet away from you after you've aff afflicted them, they, they're they already at 10 severity of afflicted physical and mm -hmm. five severity of, of afflicted vulnerable, and they'll take 10 damage from their afflicted physical at the end of their turn, and then it'll go down to afflicted physical 9. But then they took damage, so because of vulnerable, <laughs> the threat range is, 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 is terrible! It's fantastic, but it's, oh my god, terrible. And that's just the first effect of, of vulnerability. Uh, if the severity of this condition surpasses a creature's fortitude score, attacks against that creature's physical defenses have advantage. And if the severity of this condition surpasses a creature's focus score, attacks against that creature's mental defenses have advantage. Jesus. Well, you're right fucked, aren't you? You are! Mm -hmm. So, the next archetype we have is the Path of the Primal Spirit. And... So I'd, I'd say I'd say this is this is akin to the whole the whole to, the whole totem barbarian that we that we saw in core. In fact, the mm -hmm. first feature that they get is totem spirit. Mm -hmm. So choose one option among those listed below. Once you've made your choice, you cannot change it at lo at later levels. You may choose different animal totems than the ones listed as long as they are thematically similar. For example, one might choose a crocodile as their totem spirit instead of a boar yet still receive the benefits of the boar totem. So, boar, you add your resolve modifier to each d10 roll to heal yourself with primal vigor. Eagle, your movement increases by 10 feet, and you may use the disengage action as a 10-foot quick action while you are raging. Or wolf, while you are raging, attack allies within melee reach of you may make melee or thrown weapon attacks with advantage. If they do so, melee and thrown weapon attacks are made with advantage against them until the beginning of their next turn, i.e. Oh, you, 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 spread, you spread reckless attack to your allies. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's, uh. um, how does that compare to core? The, the totems for core. That's something I do want to see. Let me look. Let me load. The... Okay, so... The... I so I we'd probably be looking at the totem warrior sub subtype and obviously they had they had more um, totem spirits they had five instead of three mm -hmm. but for the for the sake of this we'll only use bear eagle and wolf so bear you have resistance to all damage except psychic um eagle other creatures have disadvantage and opportunity attacks against you and you can use dash as a bonus action. And Wolf, your friends have advantage on melee attack rolls against any creature within five feet of you that's hostile to you. I'd say th okay. So it's not a it's not it's it's not the it's same. On, it's on it's on the same theme. It's just it's just the path to it is di is different. Yes. It's also a little. Uh, there's some there's some different flavor in there that makes it a little more fun in party play. Mm -hmm. Let's see. You also gain one amongst the beasts. You gain speak with animals as a bonus feat. See, so yeah, at at seventh level, you attune to a you attune to a second beast and gain and gain more of its qualities. So either at boar. You, if it, if you would start a turn with zero vitality while raging, you gain one vitality. For eagle, whenever you expend a vitality to heal yourself while raging, 
Allies within 30 feet gain temporary hit points equal to the number of expended vitality times your resolve modifier. And Wolf, if an, if an ally within reach of a melee attack from, from you were to be hit by an attack which, tar which targets an ally's physical defense, you may, as a free action, expend one vitality, roll 1d8, and add your resolve modifier to the, to the roll. That ally's defense is increased by the total for that attack. So we've, we've, ki we've kind of got a theme here. Boar is boar is for the people who want to who want to be the who want to be the Uber tank. Um, Eagle Eagle is seems to be more about um, crowd control in in a me, in a melee sense, and Wolf is for the well party supporter. Yeah, um, the leader of the pack, as it were. Mm -hmm. At ten, at tenth level, you gain Frenzy of the Beast. While raging, you go into an animalistic frenzy as a free action. Once you use this feature, it lasts until your rage ends. You may take additional reactions each round equal to your resolve modifier, but may only use these reactions in the following ways. Whenever a creature hits you with an attack on its turn, you may use your reaction e either to make an attack of opportunity against it or to move up to your full movement towards it. Attack of Attacks of opportunity are provoked in this way. Provoked, provoked in this way are made with disadvantage. In addition, now is, is that attacks of opportunity provoked through the, the reaction you're making, or is that attacks of opportunity provoked when you do your full movement towards it? Um, I think I think it I think it's when you use your reaction. Okay, that's another point of uh, clarity. I think mm -hmm. we should ask for. Yeah, just because. Um, in addition, whenever you hit a creature with an attack on your turn. It may use its reaction to either make an attack of opportunity against you or to move its full movement towards you. Attacks of opportunity provoked in this way are made with disadvantage. Again, I... I, I, I like I said, with, with me, the only thing I'm seeing here is that nitpick of we need a little more clarity in some places. Mm -hmm. Just because that way uh, you... Not only is it is it like for you and I, it, it makes sense. Yes, the attack of opportunity provoked in this way is the attack of opportunity you're initiating with your reaction, or that the creature is initiating with their reaction when you attack them. That makes sense to both you and I as GMs, mm -hmm. as people who are experienced. That's also going to make sense to every rules lawyer who knows how to argue their way around it. Clarification helps prevent rules lawyers. Only you can prevent rules lawyers. Yes, you specifically, Tanner. Mm -hmm. You're the one writing this. <laughs> yeah. I. It seems it seems that the, it seems that the approach that's go, that's going on is, um, you is you can is. Is you can, is when ra when raging, um, there's going to be a whole there's going to be a whole lot more, um, AO there's going to be a whole lot more AOOs. Since. Mm -hmm. Since you since some, um, when someone hits you, you can do you can you can attack with disadvantage. When you hit when you hit them, they can attack you with disadvantage. It's that case. It's that case of high risk, high reward that I I feel like I feel like is one of the major themes that he's go that he's going for with the um, barbarian as a whole. Yeah. Um, and the the um, path capstone is totemic attunement. So it's. Essentially, this is the third ver the third version of the um, to of the totem. Um, for the for the boar totem, while you're raging, any creature within melee reach of you that's hostile to you is considered to have a severity of the distracted condition equal to your resolve modifier if it attacks any other creature other than you. A creature is immune to this effect if it cannot see you, cannot hear you, or if it cannot be frightened. Mm -hmm. Uh Let's look up distracted real quick. It's technically part of the hidden condition. Mm -hmm. For each severity of this condition, an affected creature that is affecting the creature, creatures which attempt to perceive or attack the creature increase the, um, the chance that they will automatically fail the roll by one. From a one to a four to a one to a five on an attack roll or to one for an ability check, for example.
All oh, right. And so, then, if, okay. if if a severity of the distracted condition mm -hmm. equal to your resolve modifier, mm -hmm. if you have a high enough resolve, let's 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 stop using twenty because that's just you know hy hyperbole at that point. But let's say you have a resolve that gives you a mod modifier of two. Mm -hmm. That makes their fail chance one through six instead of one through four. That's what mm -hmm. that does. If they're attacking anybody other than you. Mm -hmm. Of course, if they're also immune to the effect. Still, the point is is made. Yeah. So then we have Eagle. While raging, you have a flying speed equal to your current movement. <laughs> this <laughs> benefit only works in short, short bursts. You fall if you end your turn in the air and nothing else is holding you aloft. In addition, after making an attack of opportunity, you may move up to 15 feet. Moving in this way does not provoke attacks of opportunity. So you make an attack of opportunity and then essentially get a free disengage. You get to pull the kobold maneuver. <laughs> that wasn't a thing in 5e, but in, in 4e, especially at early levels, kobolds were notorious for being able to hit and then automatically shift so they could get right out of melee range. Mm -hmm. It was annoying as shit. It was annoying as shit and resulted in some very early um, party wipes. Burning hands is your friend. Mm hmm. Oh. Let's see. Then we have Path of the Brute. We didn't go over Wolf. Oh, oh sorry. Wolf, while you're raging. You may utilize a qu a ten foot quick action on your t on your turn to knock a large or smaller creature prone when you hit it with a m when you hit it with melee weapon attack typo. If the attack roll would also hit the creature's strength or dexterity defense, whichever is lower. In addition, you and allies within melee reach of you de deal an extra d6 damage to prone creatures when they hit them with melee attacks. Giant killer. <laughs> and it, it's not just a giant killer it's again the whole wolf pack mentality wolves hunt in packs and they knock things to the ground and then tear them to shreds mm -hmm. uh, then we have path of the brute another which is a case which is going to be a case of hit things gooder uh, or as I like to put it, heat we steak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I I'll just read this flavor. The path of the brute understands what it means to be a barbarian. Barbarians don't need primal affinities, eldritch knowledges, or zealous fervor. They need to hit things hard, and they need to survive. The path of the brute, while not the most complicated of archetypes, exemplifies both of those things. I love that flavor text. Yep. So, at third level, they get heavy-handed. When, whenever you attack with a melee weapon, you deal an additional 1d6 bludgeoning damage to the target, regardless of whether or not the attack mi hits or misses. It was so, too... It's the Dragon Slayer. <laughs> <laughs> it, was too it was too large to be a sword. <laughs> Well, n no, 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 no. We're we're gonna use <clears throat> that thing was too big to be called a sword, too big, too thick, too heavy, and too rough. It was more like a large hunk of iron. <laughs> pretty, pretty much. Um, and you. Know I will. Ne I will never say anything. Anything but pray, sing anything but the praises of Kentaro Muda, especially not only with his ext extraordinarily detailed art style, but that man's way with words was magnificent. You know, I I want I want to check one little thing in in equipment because I'm cu I am honestly curious if um things like spe if things like pole arms are considered heavy. Because if they are, that is going to result in a very ridiculous build. Ridiculous. As ridiculous. if 
Well, as well, ridiculous er, I guess I should say. <laughs> I was I was going to say ridiculous. Don't you mean glorious? So I'm just I'm just waiting for the equip for the equipment thing to lo to load because it's got to because it's got to load all the font. Font loves you. Yeah. So come on. But in in the in the meantime, I can in the meantime we can go into the the other third level feature, brutish nature. If you would roll an ability persuasion check which utilizes a physical ability, you can do so with advantage. Essentially, it's it's saying you're enough of a brute to intimidate people into doing what the hell you want. Mm-hmm. Because persuasion is a is a is a such a magnificent word. You can persuade people in many different ways. You can persuade them with your gilded tongue, or in the case of the Path of the Brute, you can persuade them with your not-so-gilded, iron-like muscle arms the size of tree trunks. Do an Arnie flex. They will be so <laughs> scared of you that, that that you will get whatever you want out of them. Um, I just, ch I just checked. Heavy pole arms are a thing. With a t with a ten foot reach, as you as you'd expect, so pole, so heavy pole arm. Hev so we so if somebody wanted to go Lubu with the barbarian, they could. You do not pursue Lubu. Mm -hmm. Um. Anyway, at seventh level, the path of the brute grants thick skinned. Each of your physical defenses increases by one. Your constitution score goes up by two. Okay. At tenth level, you get thicker skinned. Your con score goes up by two, and your maximum vitality goes up by two. And at fourteenth level, you get heavier handed. The damage with heavy handed increases to two d six. Brute is very much meant to be the uncomplicated subclass. See, if you if you wanted. To... If you wanted to, to sound like a grog, you would say that this is the true Babby's first archetype. To us, intellectuals, we know that this is just geetwistic and fun. Yeah, this is this is for pe this particular one is for people who are are more are more concerned with di with just constantly dishing out damage. They want to hit things good and that's 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 it. They want to hit things good, and make sure that if as so long as they're hitting things good, things end up dead and they do not. And you know what? Sometimes that childlike, simple-minded, wondrous play is all you ever need. Mm -hmm. It all depends on how you feel. We here at the monastery do not judge you for wanting to play Heat with Stick. We've all played Hit with Stick at some point. We all still play Hit with Stick at some point. Some of us just use bigger sticks. My stick is only the size of an Imperator Titan. Also, phrasing. <laughs> I know what I said! So, next is Path of the Fanatic. Which, um... F which feels... Which, the the way the description is, is given... Um... It feels like it's it feels like it's leading a little bit into bar, it, a little bit into cleric barbarian, <laughs> not not full not full on, or maybe carbarador. That is terrible. <laughs> anyway, they start they at third level they gain fanatics fervor first. Your weapons deal plus one damage for each severity of the vulnerable condition afflicting you, up to a maximum of half your level rounded up. Whenever you hit with a melee weapon attack or thrown weapon attack while raging, you may inflict a severity of the vulnerable condition upon 
upon yourself equal to your resolve modifier. All severity of the vulnerable condition gained from this feature is lost when your rage ends. Once again, we're doing, oh. that, we're doing that risk oh. reward thing. Oh no! Oh no! Monk. Monk. What? You should understand this barbarian very well. <laughs> it's a flagellant. Yep. <laughs> yep, it is. It's a flagellant. They beat themselves up to fight better. I was right. This is a baladin. This 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 is a baladin. <laughs> and you also Bardin, gain yeah. you also gain unshakable devotion. Each of your ability defenses increases by one for each severity of a harmful condition afflicting you, up to a maximum of half your level rounded up. So yeah, even more even more going in with that whole fla that whole um flagellant thing. At seventh level, they gained shared fanaticism. While raging, you may utilize a quick ac a ten foot quick action in order to expend an amount of vitality equal to half your current level, rounded up, and heal an ally within thirty feet of you. Roll one d10 for each vitality expended in this way, and add your resolve modifier to each d10. The ally gains a num gains a number of hit points equal to the total. For each vitality expended in this way, you gain one severity of the afflicted fire condition. You're literally <laughs> using your fanaticism to burn yourself to death. This fire this fire this fire damage dealt to you from this feature penetrates fire resistance and immunity. Because it's holy fire. You can't And then that pla oh my god. But and then that synergi that synergizes with unshakable devotion. Mm -hmm. Your ability defenses go up by one for each severity of a harmful condition inflicting you up to maximum of half your level. Yep. And it plays into the seventh the second seventh level feature immolate. <laughs> At the beginning of your turn, threats within five feet of you take one point of fire damage for each severity of the afflicted fire condition on you. In addition, if you hit a threat with a thrown weapon attack, it takes one point of fire damage for each severity of the afflicted fire condition on you. A threat cannot take damage from this feature multiple times in a round. You may have your fanatics fervor feature afflict fire you rather than make you rather than make you vulnerable. Probably should remove that you after the the parentheses fire. Mm -hmm. Afflict uh, yeah, that's fire yeah. rather than make you vulnerable. Mm -hmm. But then that means that means you can just make it all fire based. You can make it all fire based. You light yourself on fire to inflict more damage and catch other things on fire. It's a sister of battle! <laughs> it's a sister of battle! <laughs> yep. God damn it. Tanner. <laughs> the, uh, his manliness, the manperer of mankind, thanks you for your service. <laughs> see ne next is path to martyrdom at 10th level once per turn as a quick as a 10 foot quick action you may expend you may expend a vitality and unleash a battle cry infused with righteous energy allies of your choice within 30 feet of you that can hear you gain a bonus to their damage rolls and defenses equal to your resolve modifier in addition to the emperor they, in addition they gain advantage on attack rolls until the end of your next turn and attacks which, which target their mental defenses are made with disadvantage until the end of your next turn. When you use this feature, you gain four severity of the afflicted fire condition. Fire damage dealt to you from this feature penetrates fire resistance and immunity. At this point, this is either Joan of Arc or a sister of battle. Um, about that. 
Capstone. I know. I saw it. <laughs> Living I... Saint. Rage, burn, inspire, live, repeat. <laughs> Being at zero hit points does not impose the dispirited condition. In addition, allies within 30 feet of you gain the gain the benefits of your unshakable devotion. Which me, i.e. for i.e. for all so all the whole, all the severity buffing that you've been inflicting upon yourself, your allies get. Without needing to be debuffed. I'd say I'd say that's apropos for a for a cap, for a path capstone. I'd say that's apropos for a sister of battle's living saint. Um, sister Celestine, is that you? Why am I? Why do I have? Actually, the ty the type of the type of sororitas I keep thinking of is the um, repentia. <laughs> The Repentia don't catch themselves on fire; they just cut themselves. It's still, it's still a form of self-harm. So close enough. I just think this is the canoness. She's the one wielding all the fire. Mm -hmm. So, Path of Madness. First thing that they get is maddening form. Which, um. If the if the sisters of ba if the sisters of battle are the path of the fanatic, would the path of madness be the chaos champion? Specifically, Zinch. Yeah. <laughs> you may expend one vitality as a free action, nor to gain one of the following effects. You may expend multiple of vitality to gain multiple effects, but may not choose the same effect twice unless explicitly specified within the effect. For each vitality expended in this way, roll one d10. You take damage equal to the total in the same manner as your maddening form feature, and the and the effects end when your rage ends. First is weapon transformation. You may transform one of your arms into a melee weapon subtype of your choice. In addition, for the duration of your rage, you gain the affiliated mastery feat of the weapon forms you choose. If you transform your arm into a two-handed weapon, you must have your other arm free in order to wield it. You may choose to mutate one or one or both of your arms, and may choose different forms for each. Pseudopods, your melee reach increases by five feet. Amorphous, you gain the ability to squeeze yourself through spaces at least one inch wide and gain resistance to bludgeoning damage. Also, you may occupy the same square as other creatures, even if they are hostile to you. <laughs> Touch of madness. <laughs> Your bonus to skill and spell attacks is equal to twice your resolve modifier plus your proficiency modifier rather than resolve mod plus proficiency mod. And alter self, you may use the alter self ritual without having proficiency in rituals or providing the requisite materials. And it's Zinch. Yep. Master change. Mm -hmm. Then we have Perspective of the Mad. Which is also at um, third level. Whenever you roll for the confusion condition, you may roll twice and choose between the two rolls. Your weapon attacks deal plus one da deal plus one damage for each severity of confusion afflicting you. Whenever you are hit with an attack, you are thre while threatened, you may apply one severity of the confused condition on yourself. When you incur a confusion effect on yourself, you may ch you may choose to not purge any of the condition. So continue stacking confusion. Mm -hmm. That's what that is saying. Let's let's look at what confusion does. <clears throat> the confused condition is measured in severity, um, and if a creature is inflicted by the confused condition, it must roll a d10 at the beginning of its turn. If it rolls a number above the severity of its condition, it may move and act normally. If it rolls a number equal to or below the severity of the condition afflicting it, it is afflicted by the effect corresponding to the number it rolled on the d10. When a confusion effect is rolled, creature can choose to ignore that effect by taking 1d8 damage for each severity of the confused condition on it. Uh, 1 through 2, the creature makes one attack against a random creature when it's t within its reach. Uh, 3 through 4... The creature spends its turn babbling incoherently and cannot otherwise act on its turn. Five through six. 
the creature takes a defensive action on its movement and is or, 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 takes a defensive action and its movement is reduced to zero until the beginning of its next turn. Babbling incoherently? I don't speak Dutch. Freaky deaky Dutch. That um, yeah, we're still we're still going with Zinch with a hint with a tiny hint of Malkavian. Well, who said Zinch isn't part of the Malkav uh, network? So at seventh level, they gain Maddening Whispers. When a creature hits you with an attack, you may, as a free action, let loose the madness within you. <laughs> I was kidding about the Malkavians. Roll a D8 and consult the following effects: one through three. Each creature within 10 feet of you gains the severity of the afflicted psychic condition equal to your resolve modifier. 4 through 5, make a skill attack on each creature within a 10-foot radius sphere centered around you targeting their resolve defense. If the attack hits, a creature gains the severity of the enthralled condition equal to your resolve modifier. 6 through, se six through 7. Make a skill attack on each creature within a 10-foot radius sphere centered, around, centered upon you, including yourself, targeting its resolve defense. If the attack hits, a creature gains the severity of the confused condition equal to your resolve modifier. Or 8. Make a skill attack on each creature within a 10-foot radius sphere centered upon you, including yourself, targeting its constitution defense. If the attack hits, a creature gains a severity of the stunned condition equal to your resolve modifier. I didn't see the enthralled condition. Um, that was four and that was four through five. Mm. No, I mean in the uh, in the core mechanics, it might have been renamed. Um, if it, yeah, I don't see it either. So. It's either so enthralled either isn't in there yet or or it's hidden. Mm -hmm. The distracted cover blinded. Hmm. I don't know. Stunned is in there though, and we know what stunned does. <laughs> mhm. Mm so it's so it's a it's a case of a f once again once again that whole that whole I gain po I gain power by taking hits. Um at 10th level, they gain Mirror of Insanity. If a skill attack from your own Maddening Whispers were to hit you, you may make the roll with advantage against creatures of your choice that are also affected by the attack. Creatures which hit you with, with an attack take damage equal to the severity of the Confused Condition on you. Um, there is, this is one of those... There is a bit of a side note about, the, about a clarification which I... Um, is already is already th is already there. I would pro I'd probably make sure to have that added. Just yeah, so, just so even... you, just so it's not one roll compared to all defenses. Yeah, and and then uh, another clarification I would suggest, uh, as we were discussing before we started, um, you make make roll with advantage against creatures of your choice that are also affected by the attack, that then shares the damage. From the skill attack mm -hmm. to them, the the clarification I would put here is that you either still take the damage or you're completely reflecting the damage elsewhere. Oh, yes, I, I'm still assuming that you take the damage, as does everybody else. That's my assumption here, just because insanity and all the self inflicted stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's always a good clarification to add because again, you want to head off the rules lawyers while you, where you can. Oh yes. So the capstone for Path of Madness is Chaos of the Mind and Body. Creatures that choose to, igno choose to ignore confusion placed on them by, by you take 1d10 damage rather than 1d8. And now that's per level of severity. Remember that. Mm -hmm. And when you strike a confused creature, you may purge all the severity of the condition from it and deal psychic or physical your, your choice damage as if it had chosen to ignore the condition. So, so let... but you have to you have to hit, so it can't be a miss. Mm -hmm. So, but if you hit, and you decide, eh, the maximum damage I can do with all of my modifiers added up isn't going to be nearly as much as if I just purge this level ten confusion for ten d ten damage. Oh, and they're and they're currently uh, afflicted psychic. 
Okay, we'll make sure it's psychic damage. Mm -hmm. I told you it's Zinch. This is one one side is the Sisters of Battle, the other side is is Zinchian Barbarian. What? Corn must be turning in his wheelchair. <laughs> He's spitting out his cornflakes. <laughs> corn Berserker goes, "Damn, I got played out." Let's be honest. When we think of when we think of berserkers with the chaos gods, we're usually thinking of corn. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. Corn, corn berserkers got going. Damn, they played us out. Mm -hmm. Then again, corn does not care from when from where the blood flows. So long as it flows, mm -hmm. yeah. So, I'd say when it comes to the bar, I'd say when it comes to the barbarian. I like the I like the fact that we have um we have a more defined version of tankiness instead of just very high AC. This yeah, the there's... kind of tankiness that we have here, you want to be getting your ass kicked because one, you're get, you're going to have more HP than other people do, and two, when you get when you get your ass kicked, you get you get you get more powerful in order to kick ass back. Yeah, especially depending on which of the archetypes you take. Mm -hmm. But even with the base features, uh, the the tankiness we see here is the the damage reduction, the ability to very quickly refill HP by spending some vitality, mm -hmm. and just the general uh, increased movement and your and of course cleave. Everybody loves cleave. We all love cleave. Don't get that wrong. Um, you know. You can you, you start ignoring damage reduction. The the whole thing is this is this is not tanky to stop damage to the party. This is tanky to jump into the fray and fuck shit up. That is what this barbarian does. And all five flavors of archetype do that in a different fashion that makes each archetype worthwhile to explore. Mm-hmm. Especially the ones that are, you know, literally just remind me of uh, of Warhammer 40k. With the, I just realized that there's one that there is one there's one other character who who fit who fits the who fits this particular type of barbarian very well. Oh yeah, that Musashi Bobenke. <laughs> uh... The man who no sold a dozen arrows and was so ugly, nope, nobody wa nobody wanted to get close to see if he was actually dead, and they still and they had no I so they had no idea if he was j if he was j if he was just extraordinarily tanky or if it or if the arrows actually killed him. Yep, he definitely he he would definitely be one of these barbarians. Yeah, um. I'd say brute probably. Hit things good with thick skin, and let let's not forget that in the in the PS2 and PS3 Genji games, his weapon of choice is a log, which you can change out for a Tetsubo, and I always do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I'd if it, if if it, if it wasn't if it wasn't clear already, um. Someone go. Someone going into these this type of barbarian from the vanilla type, they're gonna ha they're going to have a bit of a um, unlearning process to deal with. Because th because again, this particular barbarian isn't a isn't about having having hi having high ass AC while being half naked. Um. If anything, I'd. I'd say I'd say the analog that I'd use for a lot of people it. Is um, you know how in a lot of vid in a lot of video games, especially especially certain action games, there is some sort of well revenge meter that is that is going to increase the more you take damage, mm -hmm. and you're going to be using that to d to do all of your better effects. That is th that is this partic that is this particular mindset. I still I still boil this barbarian down to guts. And if you want a very specific example, 
guts during the eclipse. This is guts during the eclipse. He's not wearing any armor. He has whatever weapon he can pick up off the battlefield. He loses an arm. He loses an eye. And he keeps on going. Pretty, pretty much. Um, I know. I know we made the anal I know we made the the analog regarding the regarding the fanatic and the and madness. But what would what would you suppose would be would be some that would be an analog for when it comes to the um, path of blood and the path of the primal spirit? So, if if guts during the eclipse is barbarian in general, mm -hmm. path of blood is guts with the berserk armor except obviously not wearing armor it, it is guts at his most life or death struggle moments where the only thing keeping him together is his sheer willpower against threats much larger and more powerful than he is for he is just human mm -hmm. as for I'm, the I'm, primal I'm, spirit mm -hmm. you're gonna hate me for this one try me Beastmaster. You're right. <laughs> I should I should make you rewatch Beastmaster 2 as punishment. Hey, hey, hey. Hey now. You don't need to go committing war crimes. That's my job. No, if I if I wanted to commit a if I wanted to commit a war crime, I'd have you, I'd I'd have you watch um Conquest. Okay. Look, conquest. <laughs> either, either the, I was gonna, I was gonna say the Lou Ferrigno Hercules, but no, that, but no, that, do, that doesn't qualify as torture. I mean, you could go watch, make me watch Hercules in New York, which is Arnie not knowing how to speak a lick of English. Um, he Arnie was dubbed in that movie. I know. That's what I said. He did not speak a lick of English while they were actually filming. And to be f to be fair, the iconic "I'll be back" line, um, appar apparent apparently th apparently that took a lot of work. So not far off on that front. Yeah, but I still think Beastmaster fits. Just saying. I'd say I'd say I'd say a bit I'd say a bit of a bit of that, and more more leaning into. Um, a bit, a bit of the motif that was in the fourth edition Barbarian, mm -hmm. a um, an approach with an approach with Barbarian archetypes that isn't as uh, that isn't as often explored, is the idea of them being possessed by animal spirits. Um, it's because that's the purview of the ranger, don't you know? But the, yeah, 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 go, yeah, yeah, they can. And the ranger is is the most snake bitten class in in vanilla Five E, and argu arguably previous editions. Well, it was a it was a very snake bitten class in third edition as as well. Fourth edition, not so much because all well, Orca Slayer is a thing, which was broken as all hell. Um, but there. The the mo now obviously the the most likely explanation for the berserkers' rages is the whole is the whole thing of them them being high as balls by eating the berserker mushroom. Hell, Vinland Saga did that. But the fourth edition barbarian had it that rages were its were their um, daily powers, and was leaning more into that idea of being possessed by some sort of animal spirit. And it was a, it was an attack. You entered the you entered the a rage that acted as a stance for as lo for as long until you used another da another daily that was a rage, or so you could say you, so you could say they entered beast mode. I want to throw things at you. <laughs> should have taken your chance at Cowtown. Yeah, I should. Yeah, I should have. I was too. I was. I was too. I was too busy. I was too busy psychologically torturing Bryant. <laughs> He's such a good target. But, 
getting getting back on getting back on the rails for if this if this is the now this particular approach with barbarian doesn't have the narrative arc that we saw in the level up barbarian but, but I think it makes up for it for what it has in mechanics not to mention this game that we've seen so far because we haven't taken a good look into the other parts of the mechanics yet. Mm -hmm. um, it isn't trying to create those three pillars of exploration, social, and combat that Level Up 5e was trying to. The focus I've seen, if you want your narrative, is still over in the ancestries and backgrounds. Not only do they give you things having to do with your ancestry and background, you do get a little bit of uh, roleplay fodder. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of what we're seeing here is that encounters, whatever they might be, whether they're a combat encounter where you have to wipe out all threats, or as was uh, intimated earlier, an encounter where you have endless waves and just need to get the hell out. Um, I think those are going to be more useful for storytelling than having something that hooks into the narrative. Uh, and the the loose... I guess the, the, the loose categorization of backgrounds. How, how it even said, you know, backgrounds are complex, but making backgrounds is simple. You, you had the just the very widespread categories from laborers mm -hmm. to nobles, etc. And then you could focus things down as, as necessary from there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, your reputation, your bonus feat, you, you, whether you were, you had a physically demanding, mentally demanding or rounded upbringing. Um, I think that this is, if this is focused right now. And I don't know if he has more plans, if Tanner has more plans to expand the narrative side of this game. Um, the documents that we talked about after the last uh, session regarding the actual world building seems like there is going to be a sandbox to build your own narratives in. I think he's going to leave narrative focus up to the groups, which is a viable way to make the game. Mm. Very viable. Um, I, I know that with a uh, 13th age... The narrative focus is mostly in the hands of the playgroup rather than in the in the actual system. I'd say I'd say the I'd say when it comes when it comes to that the um, when it came to Thirteenth Age the narrative aspect was largely in two things: backgrounds because mm -hmm. the, because they, because they because they, they came to the same conclusion I did that um, D, that D and D and skill and skill systems in the traditional sense don't mix, and the icon system. Especially yeah. the icon system. Yeah, and like, oh yeah, and it, and one unique thing I forgot about that part. Which was that? One unique thing. Oh yeah, the uh, the uh, one unique thing about your character. That's right. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, while the document is not finished with all of the world building, it very much looks like some of the things in that document intimate something similar to the icon system from what I was seeing. Um, Tanner, feel, feel, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, because uh, that document being as, as in progress as it is, is not something I can make all of the uh, inferences from. Mm -hmm. But I, I have, like I said, I have the big feeling that narrative and roleplay is going to be largely contingent on the player base and the GM. And that's that's fine, especially if the parts of the system that are tied to the skills, the spells, the combat all feel really good. That's a perfectly fine way to make a game. Mm -hmm. And from what I see with the Barbarian, um, yes, please. If this is what I have to expect going forward, yes, please. Uh, I, again, I, I hate to, I hate to, I hate to jinx things, but burgeoning 
cautious optimism. Your your conduct, Tanner, has has made me very impressed with this project so far. And if this is what I have to expect going forward, oh man, oh man, do you have a Kickstarter? Can I can I can I donate to that? <laughs> not yet. Not yet. He um he does have a mer he does have a he does have merch though. Maybe we can get, maybe we can buy a couple T-shirts. That would be perfectly fine. Because if at the end of this I feel like I want to buy it, um. You've you've not just done your job. You've exceeded it because most of the time I would just say, "Yeah, this is a good game." If you make me feel like I want to buy it, well, that's levels beyond. Oh, this is a good game. This is I want it. Give me. <laughs> I don't know. I might be jumping. I might be. I might be jumping jumping ahead of myself here. I might be counting my chickens a little too early, but it's a good beginning. It's a good beginning. I'll leave it there. Now, with the, with that with that said, um, next week we'll be tackling the next class we have, which is the disciple. And in from what from what I've from what I'm seeing, for all intents and purposes, this is gonna be where I, this is gonna be where I work my gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> Because it because it's the fucking monk equivalent. Um, it's what it it I had I had to although ca although calling disciple the monk equivalent doesn't f doesn't feel one hundred percent apropos, but it's gonna be the it's gonna be a um close enough kind of thing. Yeah. But. That, but we, but that is something that we will that we will tackle in in about seven days or next or next Friday, whichever comes first. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>